başlayalım. Ha? İnşallah. Okay, I guess we are live, right? Yeah. Okay. <gülüyor> so we are live. Uh, Esselamu Aleyküm. I want to welcome you all once again. Uh, I'm the guest moderator for evet, this period, inşallah. which is uh, about I, I-ness. So the slide's title is Change the Human I-ness. I personally liked this. Maybe we can ask Colin Hocam if this is in the uh, social science literature, I-ness. If not, I, I think it, it looks nice to me. I like it. I, I haven't seen it, but maybe it is. I, I'm, I'm not really au fait with all of the all of the literature but it's better than ego okay yeah maybe we can contribute to social literature. Wait, wait. this will be our legacy in shot no. <laughs> yeah Inus. It, it looks nice yeah. <laughs> so uh, from last week uh, we started discussing this 30th word which is uh, part of the treatise um, or let's say it's itself treatise part of the book Uh, words and this is very vol valuable and important as mentioned by uh, uh, Colin Hojam uh, last week it is very unique in many senses and it gives us to understand many uh, different treasures of Quran universe and ourselves um, so if you remember the start of this treatise is this verse which is from Surah Al-Ahzab and we uh, started talking about the trust in this verse in the first place. And uh, we try to position any, um, I, um, with respect to this trust. So it was explained as just any was part of the trust. So we started like this and we discussed about why uh, human beings are attributed as uh, Zalum and Jehul uh, at the end of the verse, unjust and foolish. Uh, one translation mentioned here. Uh, so because briefly we mentioned that uh, we don't know anything really. So for this, we are subject to doing some criminal stuff, you know, in brackets or unjust stuff. So uh, in practical life, uh, that's being unjust. And also in the theoretical part of us, which is lacking knowledge really. So this verse quite miraculously refers to the condition of uh, ourselves. So we just keep on where we left. I just want to um, start reading and I'm going to start with the last question one of our um, listeners, brothers, sisters asked uh, later on and we will move on discussing. Just as the eye is the key to the divine names, which are hidden treasures, so is it the key to the locked talisman of creation. It is a problem-solving riddle, a wondrous talisman. When its nature is known, both the eye itself, that strange riddle, that amazing talisman is disclosed, and it discloses the talisman of the universe and the treasures of the necessary world. The key to the world is in the hand of man and is attached to his self. For while being apparently open, the doors of the universe are in fact closed. God Almighty, Allah, has given to man by way of a trust such a key called the eye that it opens all the doors of the world. He has given him an enigmatic eye with which he may discover the hidden treasures of the creator of the universe. But the eye is also an extremely complicated riddle and a talisman that is difficult to solve. When its nature and the purpose of its creation are known, as it is itself solved, so will be the, so will be the universe. The all-wise maker gave to man as a trust an eye which comprises indications and samples that show and cause to recognize the truths of the attributes and functions of his dominicality so that the eye might be a unit of measurement 
and the attributes of dominicality and functions of divinity might be known. However, it is not necessary for a unit of measurement to have actual existence. Like hypothetical lines in geometry, a unit of measurement may be formed by hypothesis and supposition. It is not necessary for its actual existence to be established by concrete knowledge and proofs. Yeah, I think I'm gonna stop here, go back. That's, uh, I guess, uh, if we can make it up to this end this week, I think that's uh, that will be really good. So I'm gonna start with the question leftover. Uh, maybe I can start uh, with Colin Hojam, then Mustafa. By the way, I forgot to introduce Mustafa. Mustafa, just pardon me. Mustafa is also our um, respected knowing uh, brother friend and his expertise is in engineering, <laughs> both PhD in engineering in general. So he has a look to the Quran from engineering perspective. So you can ask questions from this perspective as well. Sure. So, um, the question from the last week was the relationship of I and nefs. You know, uh, the question was, what is the difference between I and nefs? So, maybe we can start with clarifying this, then we can start uh, discussing from this paragraph that we just left. Colin Ojam, can you just uh, describe us the connections between nefs and I, are they the same? How they are different? How do we understand this? Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All I know is that they're not synonymous, that we have the um, amana, the trust, which is a bundle of different things, you know, it's a package. And among that package, there is our soul, our heart, our um, lataif, you know, these subtle faculties that we have, such as imagination, conscience, all our senses, all of these are, are a package which comes to us as the trust. And part of that package is our nafs, and also part of that package is our ana. So I can't really locate ana in a particular precise place, only that it's part of the package that comes via the amana. But it's not the same as nafs. Ana is something distinct, although clearly there is an interconnection. But the precise nature of that interconnection, I'm afraid I have no idea. Yeah, thank you so much. I think this is a good point that we know uh, I and is different than nafs. Maybe this gives us a way to pay attention more on what this treatise is really saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I also concur. I mean, it's probably um, a part of the package, but also I guess when we understand the attributes of each, right? I mean, it it makes probably more sense uh, because like nafs is a faculty of ours which is fond of immediate pleasures, instant gratification, that type of feelings. But I, you know, could be something bigger, but it it has this sense of ownership, the sense of you know being a self and a unit, something that is almost self-sustaining type of a unit or, or something that is independent from other things, that, that sense, you know, it probably might permeate through nafs in some senses, but I definitely is not the same as nafs in that sense because I doesn't have to always seek instant gratification. It is more like a self-awareness type of a part of human. Um, human construct, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Very nice um, explanations. I hope this clarifies uh, some notions that we are treating any different than nefs, at least. So uh, shall we start with this sentence? When the NS nature, when its nature is known, both the I itself and the strange riddle, that amazing talisman is disclosed. And it discloses the talisman of the universe and treasures of the necessary world. Can we discuss this a little bit, uh, starting with you, Colin Hojam? Can we discuss this um, sentence? I think this is what we will be discussing throughout the rest of the of, of the piece. Um, 
because I think we need to read a little bit more before we can actually see how the eye discloses. Clearly, there's an interconnect. There's there's a connection between eye and the universe. There's a very important connection. Um, but I think before we go there, I think we have to look at what for me is one of the most enigmatic sentences in the whole of the Risale. Um, one of the most momentous observations that Ustad has made, and that is about a couple of sentences down, the, the doors of the universe. Is it okay if we start there? And we can yeah, yeah, please. And... You know, I, I'm just trying to just um, balance within ourselves. So, you know, feel free to just jump here and there. I, yeah, I, I think if we understand talisman here as rather as a mysterious puzzle, I, I think we discussed talisman um, mm -hmm. And we said that talisman is not really a suitable translation for tilsim. Um, talisman means something else in English. It means like um, a, a charm or an amulet which wards off evil. So there's an idea of magic there, which is unsuitable. If we understand talisman as mysterious puzzle, um, we can see that the key to that puzzle, the solution lies in the eye, but the eye itself is a mystery. It's an enigma. Um, if we solve the enigma of the I, we can solve the puzzle of the universe. And through that route, we can understand the hidden treasure um, that, that God talks about um, when he says, I was a hidden treasure and I created the universe, the, the cosmos in order to be known, loved and worshipped, etc. But before we go there, um, there is this sentence which has occupied my mind for years now. And this is the sentence um, in which Ostad says, the doors of the universe appear to be open, but they are in fact closed. As I said, I think this is, <clears throat> for me at least, one of the most enigmatic sentences mm -hmm. in the whole of the Risale. And I, I understand, <clears throat> excuse me, I understand the doors of the universe being appearing to be open on two levels. <clears throat> Firstly, <clears throat> scientists, for example, claim to have solved all of the big questions, apart from what happens the second before the Big Bang. Apart from that, most, if not all of the questions have been answered. And those that haven't been answered, they say, will eventually yield to scientific inquiry at some point. Also, secular scientists tell us that the kind of questions that science is not able to answer, the, the metaphysical questions, are in fact not worth asking. They say this because they claim that anything that doesn't yield to scientific scrutiny is a waste of time. One can never know because science can never show. That is their slogan in a sense. That's what they've told us and that's what they accentuate. And also they frame the why questions as how. So when we ask why, they tell us how which is no answer at all. In fact, the why questions are the most important ones. And it's these questions, why am I here? Why was I created? Why am I destined to die? These kind of questions are the important questions. And it's precisely these kind of questions that we are dissuaded from asking. And this is one reason why the doors of creation are not open. Because to say that they're open is to imply that all the interesting questions have been asked and they've been answered and they've been solved. But in reality, that's not the case. What is a human being? Why has humankind been created? That's a question that's hardly been touched, let alone answered. <clears throat> so that's the first way in which it is quite clear that the doors of the universe are not open, even though they are portrayed as being open. The second way, and I, I apologize for, for going on and I promise to, to stop speaking soon. The second way in which it's clear that the doors of the universe are closed concerns the secularization of creation. And as we know, with modernity, with the decline of faith and with the, the growth of secularity, the universe itself has been secularized. And all of its connections to the creator have been cut, have been severed. All of the links that used to exist between created beings and their creator have appeared to have been cut. So when I, as a modern um, secular person, look at a cherry tree, 
I no longer see reflections of knowledge, wisdom, power, generosity, compassion, beauty, order, you know, and all of the other things which the creator of the cherry tree has reflected in the cherry tree. So the names of God, which are the pillars that hold up the cosmos, are no longer visible. Today, when we look at the cherry tree, all we see is wood. We see a tree trunk, branches, leaves, twigs, blossoms, flowers, fruits, red or, or reddish yellow fruits full of vitamin C. Sometimes we see a bird's nest, sometimes a squirrel running up the tree, but that's all. All I see of the cherry tree is its exterior. I see the superficial shell. I don't see what this amazing self-contained world that we call the cherry tree is reflecting. I don't see what it's manifesting. That link, that connection has been cut. So for someone nurtured by modern secular civilization, there is no notion of the cherry tree as a book, as something which ought to be read and interpreted. Now, you must have heard of the expression, he's like an open book. Oh, John, he's like an open book. He's very easy to understand. There's no hidden side to him at all. Well, for modern man, the cherry tree is an open book. It's easy to read because there's not really very much to read. Mm -hmm. It's just a cherry tree. That's all. What else do you think it could be? It's wood and its leaves and its flowers and its fruits. And in the spring, it's a nuisance because its blossoms blow all over my car and they stick to it after I've washed it. And if I could, I would uproot that tree because it gives me nothing but grief. Meaning? What do you mean, meaning? You're asking me what the cherry tree means? <laughs> That's a very strange question to put to a modern. Because to modern man, the idea that creation is a closed book that needs to be opened and carefully read and interpreted, that is an alien idea. If you're going to see the universe as a book, it's much easier to see it as an open book, something that's easy to read because there's nothing much written there. So modern man sees the doors of creation as being open. Nothing to see there, nothing to solve, nothing to read, nothing to ponder. But Nursi Ostad Nursi has other ideas. For him, the doors of the universe are closed. And the only way that they can be opened is by using the key that God has given to all of us in the form of the eye, the human eye, which while itself is a puzzle, is also a puzzle solver. Yeah, amazing. Thank uh, you. Very, <clears throat> very brilliant and uh, just to the point. Uh, I don't want to cut this uh, flow of this discussion very nicely, and I just want to connect this to Mustafa. What do you want to say? Yeah, I mean, really, it was very eloquently explained by uh, Colonel Jamie. This, indeed, you know, this sentence is a key, and um, it's, it's also from one of the older works of, right, originally from Shemma, one of the older works of Ustad uh, Nursi. So, some of his older works are also somewhat enigmatic or, or you know, condensed a little bit so that it, it's probably also why this sentence is also a, li a little bit more condensed in its nature but yeah in the sense that like you know a, in other parts right the the point of view of a human being is really the key right and went um and and we called universe being a book that is to be read uh, it needs an eye that can read it I mean, and I, that is like human eye, but also the I-ness, right? The Anna who can read it. And again, we need that filter. We need that lens to look through. Um, it's like one of these, you know, hidden, you know, messages on a wall or something. If you shine a light in a certain way or look through it through a special lens, you're able to see the hidden message. Um, and that mm, lens is, and the, and in this context, is called a key, right? Is given through the concept of Anna, I. And through that, um, we can gain that lens that can, you know, look at a cherry tree in Kulmajam's exa example, right? And instead of seeing wood, we would see wisdom. Instead of, um, you know, nuisance, we would see um, knowledge and beauty and a message that is talking to us. 
because again, you know, at later parts of this uh, portion, we will shall I read is that um, again, the concept of I is that um, reflection point of those messages from the universe. And if it can find that point of support in, in us, it can stick. Otherwise, um, as as happened with modern scientists, um, all those messages can just go in vain because it doesn't find that point of support to be to hold on to in the human's um, eyeness or ego in, in, in that sense, um, because it might be also ego in the context of um, a scientist having an ego. Um, but yeah, so inshallah, you know, as we go through this part, some of these more details of um, nature of human eye, um, I hope inshallah will be um, revealed. And as, as that opens up, um, we can understand this even better, I hope, inshallah. Yeah, hopefully we'll move on. Uh, yeah, great explanations. By the way, dear people from audience, if you have questions, you can just uh, type in and I can just reflect your questions to add to the discussion. Uh, <clears throat> while moving on, can I ask, why do you think here I is described as an extremely complicated riddle? Uh, maybe we don't have clear answers, but at least why uh, Allah, the creator, uh, deliberately preferred I to be a complicated riddle? Uh, do you have any approach or did you ever question if you find this meaningful? I mean, from the opposite sides, if it were easy, like... We could derive a formula and we, we would say, okay, you know, if I pray five times a day, if I, let's say, um, just do some activities during the day, just read this passage uh, from these uh, holy sources whatsoever, and the I is solved. It's not riddle anymore. And you will see a different universe. But it's not like this. Why not? And I, I can give my two cents and then maybe I, I would hope Kuno Jam would have a better explanation. But like um, the upcoming part about like I having no external existence, but at the same time being a tool to understand the rest of the creation, right? And being a um, unit of measurement, right? That, that concept by itself isn't easy to um, wrap someone's around some, some wrap someone's head around so in the sense that um like there is that sense of ownership but at the same time you don't really own anything because uh, allah owns everything so uh, that i guess making sense of that um, seemingly opposing ideas could be you know difficult to solve uh, for for some and that is one aspect that I can think of that why it could be hard. But I, I, I hope, you know, Colin brother will have more explanations too. Actually, uh, mashallah, almost word for word, you said what I was thinking. Um, you know, some people say, well, why doesn't Allah make it easier for us? Make everything obvious and make everything straightforward. But that's not possible i'm not saying it's not possible for allah of course it is for him but it's not possible for us because in actual fact we're dealing here with the names of god and you know as as mustafa said much more eloquently than i can articulate it right at this minute because it's sort of a new idea in my head um we eventually are going to have to square up our own apparent attributes with allah's attributes the the reason why we have been given the eye is because we have samples of those attributes or reflections of those attributes. And because in actual fact, there is no such thing as my attributes and God's attributes. There is only God's attributes. So trying to square that with the reality, um, I need to own those attributes. I need to have an apparent ownership. And as Mustafa said, this is something that we'll be seeing as we go through the the passage, I have to own my 
attributes and then disown them. Um, I have to realize that actually they're not my attributes to own, but falsely, I have to own them in order to disown them. This is, it's, it's a riddle. Uh, I think this is why Ostad says this is a riddle itself. There's an enigma here. Um, it's not easy. Uh, these are not easy issues to, to deal with. So saying that Allah could have made it easy for us, well, actually, no, because it's, it's human beings that have to understand. And it is difficult to, to rationalize and internalize um, God's attributes and to pretend at the beginning that they're ours. Does that make sense? Because that's why I've been saying, let's go further and let's, you know, let's cross this bridge when we come to it, is because that is the secret to this. The secret to this is the fact that I, the I, has samples or reflections of the divine attributes, which we grow up thinking are ours. And that's the only way we can understand them, because if we didn't have samples of the divine attributes, we wouldn't be able to um to relate to them um but at the same time we grow up um thinking that these attributes are our own and then at the end of the day we have to disown them as we'll see and i think this is why um ostad is saying you know i is an extremely complicated riddle and itself it's a puzzle but once you crack it you know once you've solved that um, theoretically, once you've solved it, then the purpose of creation, its creation, will become clear. So I think we're going to have to read on and we'll, we will see why it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, very nice. And <clears throat> just to the point, I have a question from, from one brother, uh, Rich. Uh, he asks, is the complicated riddle I like the true self as opposed to the ego self? as some spiritual teachers might say. If I've understood him correctly, I think he's spot on. Because the ego self is the self that believes it owns some attributes. And the real self, the true self, is the self that realizes it doesn't. So I think Rich is, uh, is spot on there. Mustafa, what do you think? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it is true self if uh, if we you know of course you know um, i don't know all the spiritual aspects of the of the term uh, but from what i can understand indeed like true self right i mean ego self would find the point of support in oneself or will try to find the point of support um you know in all these i guess we you know um in all these like self help book self help books and things like that you know find your inner um force you know trust in yourself type of a thing but actually that is this probably closer to this ego self and what we are trying to find out and achieve and uh, uncover here is something more like a understand yourself your true self being um not having real power but again through that you can find the creator and that he controls everything and the real true point of support is not really um trusting yourself but is in trusting god and in that sense i guess it is a more truer version of the self a more true interpretation of the meaning of a self um if that is any, I don't know if it is any clearer than. Or... Yeah, and I think also it is included in what is open and what is closed. Mm -hmm. So ego self seems to me it is very open. As you say, you can write many self-help books on how ego self, you know, enlarges itself, expands whatsoever, because it is clear. People, you know, from here, actually, people is even... Uh, considered as as god i mean they can grow into god so with ego self you know to, to the degree of uh, uh, freabun uh, pora so but the true self uh, yeah i think still silently steals over there as, as a riddle also i feel like this is an amazing opportunity for us and i i feel like i don't feel how i should feel because this gives us opportunity 
to be given a new birth. I mean, if I can crack this, uh, I can see everything differently. That's really, you know, uh, so this point, and I point seems very important for me. Maybe my ultimately the first goal or my first ultimate puzzle to try to solve. Well, I would agree with that because it's the key. It's the key to everything. And the thing is, I read the Anna Rizalasi maybe like 35 years ago for the first time. And I, I'm still trying to understand <laughs> 35 years later because it's just so deep and so profound and so mm -hmm. succinct. Um, today, we I had another um, study circle before this one, and we happened to be looking at Anna in that one in that study circle as well. And someone, um, when we got to the open doors thing, I did the usual thing that I do, and I explained how I understood it, and he added something to it which i'd never ever thought of before and so this is something that's going to be unfolding you know and uh, because we all have anna and we all have uh, samples of the names we all have the same problem the same the burden of the the, the, the trust in one sense it's a burden um we all have the sort the, the the the puzzle to solve until we die so this is something that you know we need to unpack at our leisure um, and not worry if we don't get everything the first time round. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, shall I take this sentence? The all-wise maker gave to man as a trust and I, which comprises indications and samples that show and cause to recognize the truths of the attributes and functions of his dominicality, so that the I might be a unit of measurement and the attributes of dominicality and functions of divinity might be known. I think this is a tough sentence uh, to be discussed on and one of the essences of Ene seems like. Eight. Mustafa, do you want to take it? I mean, the... You know, of course, one thing, again, you said I'm an engineer, yes, I'm an engineer, and the unit of measurement, right, as soon as I saw that, I kind of cling to it, right? Um, so yeah, the, that's the safe water for you, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'll go, yeah, I'll, I'll go through the safe route, and I can probably, you know, try to, I, and I reflected back on, right, like what in science, um, science itself, right, what we, um, when we look at it, is a way to describe things to us. Does it describe it fully? You no, know, as we talked about, or as Kornoja brought up um, something, I mean, very eloquently was that it doesn't fully describe things, but it certainly describes certain relationships between things. And when it tries to describe things, it needs, a, it, it needs tools, it, de it needs communication devices to um, convey those descriptions. And in that sense, right, a unit of measurement is something like that. So, for example, when we say temperature, right, like Celsius degrees or degrees Fahrenheit, that is not really, you know, by itself, it is not, and it connects maybe to the next sentence too, but it's a unit of measurement. But what it gives us is a sense to extrapolate. For example, when we say, you know, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit, or, or it boils at 100 degrees Celsius, or I guess there's like 200 something Fahrenheit. Um, and then when we say, okay, we can relate to those because we know we have seen a frozen water, we have seen a boiling water. And, and based on that, when someone says, okay, iron melts at 1500 degrees Celsius. We haven't probably seen a molten iron. We don't have uh, a sense, but when we hear that it is, you know, 1500, um, like 15 times more than boiling point of water, we have that sense and we can make sense out of that. And we can say, okay, based on that unit of measurement, this is, you know, 15 times hotter than um, you know water's boiling temperature so it gives us that comparison sense and the, the second i guess think about 
in those measurements and the goes back to actually original um, term in Turkish is Wahid uh, Qiyasi, so I, say, I guess it's probably Arabic too. Wahid Qiyasi is, is like a, a unit, uh, something to compare against, uh, right? So especially because when we are dealing with engineering projects and things like that, when we, for example, have something that is not really known, um, it's, harder it, it's hard for us to um give an exact number right i mean we can try to estimate by estimating certain things but we still need to compare it to certain things for, for example and that's like how human mind probably works right i mean with uh, we are better at comparing things uh, rather than just um uh, assigning a value to it for example when we say like how many feed is a school bus people would have a varying number of uh, opinions and it might not be converging on one answer or it might you know uh, in total but then again if i ask is a school bus bigger than a car i mean and then when we compare two things it's easier for us to say okay i mean the the the, the answers will be unequivocal and it, it will always say okay yes it is bigger so a comparison point like we we think be better um, and we can relate to things better if we can compare something to another and, and that unit of measurement that meaning and in this context i think the the self the i is that unit of measurement um, and then again in the next sentence it says it might not have an actual existence right so Celsius is not really an actual existence, but it is something that we can relate to and that we can understand and compare different things to each other. And in that sense, I wanted to just uh, dwell on this like unit of measurement a little bit so that yeah, yeah, I, I guess think it's, the, it's a key be point. Beautiful, beautiful pondering, you know. Um, thank you, Mustafa. And yeah. I feel like this unit of measurement position of uh, NA just gives us a way to sense the attributes of uh, divinity, right? Attributes of dominicality of Allah. So, Colin uh, Ojam, do you wanna just take this further? Yeah, I think that that Mustafa has said all that needs to be said, really. Um, I feel out of my depth when it comes to science and engineering and all of these things, so I can't really give it the kind of uh, authenticity that Mustafa can give it. All I can say is, I've got something, Allah's got something, I look at the something I have, and it tells me something about that which Allah has. That's a very crude, very childish way of putting it, but that's how I get it. And that thing that I have actually doesn't really exist, just to uh, confuse it a bit more. It doesn't actually have to have an actual existence. So therefore, I don't have to worry about being classed as a heretic if I say that I've got something and Allah's got something. Because actually that's something that I have is actually non-existent. But at the same time, it, it, it I appear to have this thing, this, this sample, this indication that allow me to make a comparison between myself and God. That's yeah, as much wonderful. as I can say. And this thing that I have, whether it's a reflection of God's names or whether it's small samples of God's names. Um, you know, like when you want to paint a wall and they give you a tiny, tiny, tiny little container of paint just to show the color and you can go home and you can test it. I think they call it a, a tester. Um, we've got samples, you know, we've got sort of little examples of what Allah has, but we don't actually have it because it doesn't really exist. It's just there, as Mustafa said, like um, I think he gave an example, was it uh, Celsius? Well, I give an example of like kilo. Mm -hmm. A kilo doesn't exist, does it? If you go to a shop and say to the grocer, can I have five kilos? And he'll say, kilos of what? I say, well, no, I just want five kilos. He'll think you're crazy because kilo doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. it's only, it only exists if it's potatoes or tomatoes or, or whatever. So... Uh, whatever I've got that allows me to make this comparison doesn't really need to exist. 
Yeah, even you know that starting point for Anna is amazing. Uh, I isn't have a thought something. Isn't it just amazing that it doesn't yeah. exist? Yeah, but it helps a lot for for anything. Yeah, yeah you know, reminds me of this placebo pills. So although there is nothing inside, uh, you just psychologically feel well. Um, so in terms of medicine, it has no existence, but you know, uh, when it is used in the correct way, it just makes you feel good in a way. Yeah, that's a good example of placebo. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. Huh, um, shall I move on or do you want to discuss more on this? I'm just trying to think that do we now unpack that here? Um, is it clear what it means? You know, it's not necessary for a unit of measurement to have actual existence. It means concrete existence, doesn't it there? I think so. Yeah. yeah, like it's like, again, I mean, there is some notion. I mean, if notion is an existence, I guess, that we can call it's an existence um, or, you know, in that, in the context, right? Celsius or kilos. Pounds. Yeah, they don't exist, do they? Celsius doesn't exist, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. And you, to establish it, to establish its um, existence or to ex establish the concept, you still um, need to, I guess, compare or, or base it upon certain existing things. However, uh, once you establish um, that standard, it does. It becomes the standard, and then it doesn't need to really exist as as an external object anymore, right? I mean, I mean, for example, you establish zero degrees Celsius at water's freezing point, and then you and you establish hundred degrees Celsius at water's boiling point at a certain pressure, I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but then again, after you do that, uh, after you establish that scale on certain objects, it doesn't need an external existence anymore. It just becomes a tool where you can use and do calculations and compare and understand bigger things. Um, so actually, um, this brings uh, a notion to my mind, you know, we are using in statistics random variable, so you cannot uh, you cannot give a value a specific value to a random variable because we are saying that a random variable fits a distribution, so it can take the value of three or three point one or three point one two, so it doesn't really exist as a single value. But as a distribution, you understand that it exists. And I think uh, the quantum physics notion is kind of similar. You know, you, we are saying that you can imagine the position of a particle such as electron. But if you suppose the position, you cannot uh, predict the velocity or just the opposite. If you predict the velocity, you cannot know the position. So. You know, it's not to the details of the scientific complexity, but I think the <laughs> message is clear over there that we cannot specifically know some stuff. If you are to know something specifically, it doesn't exist at all. But if we are to look at it in more general, we can say that it really exists, but specifically it doesn't exist. So uh, this notion just came to my mind to just give an example of NA. By the way, Baikar RB just asks to the point, it says, uh, is its level of existence, NA's level of existence different than absolute one or it does not exist at all? That's a, that's a very good question. It doesn't exist at all, does it? Um, it uh, I don't know now, I'm a bit confused because you know, if I buy five kilos of potatoes and take them home, my wife doesn't say, okay, I can see the potatoes, but where are the kilos? You know, the kilo there is, is, is assumed. And it's important because she wanted five kilos and not four kilos. But there's actually no kilos there at all. But yet there is. So it doesn't have, it has a, a maybe to answer a Brother Baikar's question, 
we can say that Anna has an external reality. You can talk about it, but it doesn't have a concrete external existence. It's not makhluk in that sense. It's not created. Does that make any sense? I would like, agree. I like the kilo, you know? It comes like the to kilo. existence to, for comparison reason, but whenever a self understands that he really does not have the power of anything because he is contingent, all dependent on Allah in any sense, then, you know, and it doesn't exist at all. Nothing else. But I think this state of human is not uh, sustainable. We always have an Anna existing. But whenever we understand that it has nothing or it doesn't exist, then it is the uh, true reason of uh, ha having an existence. Yeah. <laughs> the true, the true reason for an to exist is to to is to, is to, to acknowledge disappear. that it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's. Yeah. Yeah. And this will, is how I understand. Yeah, and he will probably like, later in this, um, not in this piece, but I mean, in, in the, towards this text, right? I mean, he will explain that the the, the thinner it gets, the better it is, right? It, it, or or you can you it can get bigger but this all um again on our minds like in our minds we can try to assume that it has an external existence uh, but it doesn't change the reality of course the reality is that it is a unit of measurement it is it is not a um absolute existent thing out there it is it is a tool um it is it is some abstract notion to a device um, to tell us about our creator. But then again, our perspectives and our mm, level of giving it importance um, can artificially make it look like it has an existence because we assume that it has. And of course, that is a dangerous path because um, I guess I want to say in the beginning too, like one reason of this, I mean, at the beginning of this um, whole chapter, um, right, it says we will explain its nature and its results, right? I mean, it's like we are discussing the nature of it, but at the end of the day, um, it can take different shapes per person uh, and it might have different results, right? The same uh, notion led uh, Prophet Muhammad to understand the creator unlike anyone else. But at the same time, that same tool, the same device led Pharaoh to deny all the signs, all the miracles that he has been seeing um, at the hands of Moses. So, so in that in that sense, it it is, I guess, hard to pinpoint because it does depend on the person. It does depend on where we are on our journey towards understanding it. Um, but at the end of the day, I guess, it doesn't need to have an external existence, but it might seem to have one, um, depending on the person, I guess. I think maybe just to allay the fears of people who may be thinking that we are entering, you know, this ethereal realm of, sof you know, this sof sophistry where nothing <laughs> exists or, you know, we don't exist at all, we are nothing. We do exist, our nafs has a concrete existence, definitely, as, as does our, our outer frame. But the Anna doesn't. You know, Anna is a unit of measurement. It doesn't need to exist. All it needs to do is to do its job um, and to do its job properly, you know, that for our sake. But it doesn't need to have a concrete real existence, just as kilo doesn't have an existence, just as Celsius doesn't, or milliliter, or any of these measurements. They are just conventions that help us talk and help us compare and help us function. That's all. Uh, Brother Mustafa Altunkaya just inserts the definition of kilogram. So a kilogram has an um, internationally accepted definition. It's a long one. Just if, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, if you want to see that, just please take a look at the chat. He just inserted. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brother Rich also says, perhaps we say take the measure of men, but we can really only take a unit of measure of men. So much less can we take the measure of Allah. Yeah, yeah. That's very nice. Yeah, very nice. 
definitely. Yeah, it's good to distinguish. I mean, we are not saying that we don't exist at all, but you know, here the, the topic is I, and we see that uh, partic sometimes it doesn't really exist and sometimes it exists, it seems like. Based it's on a the shock to the system, I think. Anna, you know, reading Anna Risale say, as you said, um, uh, Harun, you said it's like a rebirth. But it's like it's like a big slap in the face, you know, the first time you read it, <laughs> right. the first time you read it. And then you realize when you get further down that I I have wisdom. Who, who says that I don't have wisdom? Who says that my knowledge is not mine? I studied for I studied for 13 years. Of course, I, my knowledge is mine. And then suddenly you realize that, no, your knowledge is something that is mediated by this thing called Anna. And it's only there to show that that knowledge is not yours, that it's his knowledge. And you mm. think it's yours because it's a necessary fiction. You've been allowed to think like that in order for you to understand something else. But the danger is, and this is what I alluded to at the beginning of the session, the danger is, is that when we get these samples, we no longer see them as samples, we see them as our own. We see them as um, elements of our ownership. And they're no longer samples, they're ours. And that's when we get, if we are of a pious uh, disposition, we get into these strange ideas about self-perfection. And we start to try to perfect our attributes and to become more godlike. When in actual fact, we have to do the other way around. We have to disavow these attributes and become less godlike, less idol-like, because, you know, self-idolatry is one of the results of um, uh, Anna when it's misunderstood. So become less godlike and more abd-like. It's a shock. It's a shock to the system. And actually, someone else said that to me um, yesterday or the day before when we were discussing this. He said, the first time I read Anna, it was a shock. Because suddenly I was confronted by my own lack of ownership. And this is what we fear the most, is not being in control and not owning. True, very true, yeah. Yeah, it's a shocking at this point, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how time flies, you know, we have only five oh. minutes to wrap up. Um, so shall we go ahead with this question? Or shall we discuss a little bit more on these? How do you feel like we, we just have five minutes? Well, you haven't given your opinion very much. You know, in line with you, it's good. You know, being listener is much more beneficial uh, than I think. So <laughs> then I'm very selfish listen. at this then point. Then let us listen. <laughs> let us listen to you then. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, I, I'm just uh, trying to moderate your beautiful discussion with. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we are we are just, uh, you know, uh, Said Nursi has uh, a statement like he's saying in one of his writings that he is just trying to dig a treasure. He's saying that I'm just uh, turning around a treasure. I'm trying to dig into something, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, you know, he, it's a very enigmatic sentence for me also. So anything related to the existence, to self, to NA, let's say in the context, they're very valuable. And I believe it's a matter of uh, craftsmanship. We should just uh, vary to the pay attention to the very minute details of what's going on with the creation and with the existence and our position with respect to existence. And... Um, here, these um, discussions just uh, brings to my mind that um, NA is something for me to be fine-tuned um, towards existence. As you say, I shouldn't take the face value of a tree. I should fine-tune my um, NA in a way that I pursue um, any ordinary, and nothing is ordinary, by the way, right? So I should take any ordinary as miracle. 
And many scientists has this vision, actually. I know, for instance, Einstein says there are two perceptions. Either you see everything ordinary or everything is miraculous. So that's very true. I think it gives an implication that Einstein is getting around this NA riddle also. Uh, that's the topic of everyone. That's the ocean for everyone. So um, I would say, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, as you say, shock myself to be fine-tuned in order to calibrate and understand uh, how this universe can be opened in a way stated like this. Yeah. Indeed. And I guess um, one last thing that I had my notes so that I don't lose it is that like this unit of measurement when we think about it and, uh, and like for worldly things when we use unit of measurements it's easy because everything that we see is finite but when we talk about the attributes of God those are infinitely large that cannot be really measured in the sense that like what is the measure of uh, infinite thing so but at the at at one in, in, in you know in one sense it can give us a, a measure of scale although the scale is infinitely large but at least it is you know better than not having any scale at all um in in that sense um so it is it is it might be even harder to understand than a unit of measurement but, that, but then it, because the what to measure is infinite uh, but then again, it is a scale, and it is useful, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, but maybe one more thing. You know, Khalil we had discussed this uh, thing before with you. We, uh, it was a good opportunity to discuss this NA with you before. So it comes to my mind from these discussions. Uh, there was this def definition about the relationships. Like... Um, for me to understand the existence, I am building up relationships. So um, in mathematics, in anything, uh, defining relationship is very important. It is called distance or similarity. So define the, define, defining distance or similarity to any object, uh, it is the essence of science, I would say. Right. If, right. if you cannot define a distance or similarity to any object, you cannot assume or you cannot give meaning to anything else so for us NA just serves as a building block to build a relationship to anything so if I don't assume my power let's say I cannot have a relationship with uh, Allah's power so I think relationship was one of the keywords that uh, that was generating during these discussions uh, and would that lead in then to Tanzi and Tashbi on another on another level? Because you know you've got a similarity, but then you have to say, well, okay, I'm it's similar. There is this similarity, but also, you know, I am I have knowledge. Allah has knowledge, but clearly Allah has knowledge in a way that I don't. Um, or am I just here looking for something which you know, am I barking up the wrong tree, as they say? No, that's right. Of course, it's, it will bring danger. Yes, here's the danger. And I think we will be getting into the dangers because, yeah, yeah. you know, in, in the coming passages, and it will have two faces. So yes. in, my, in one phase, uh, this relationship will prove itself to be very beneficial. But in the other phase, it will prove to be, you know, catastrophe. So yeah, yeah. Toxic, yeah. Toxic, yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if we don't have any questions from audience, I think uh, I'm going to wrap up after a traditional nice prayer from uh, Mustafa maybe this time. Oh, okay, inshallah. Um, you know, I pray that Allah gives us the understanding of the mystery of I um, and lead a life according to he, what he taught us through his messengers and understand the creation and the universe based on our understanding of ourself, inshallah. Subhanaka la ilana illa ma'allamtana inna ki anta alimul hakim wa khruda wa humin alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen al-fatiha.
Uh, have a great day. Hope to see you next week. There is a question. Thank you very much. We will continue this topic next week. I I think yes, we will be continuing this topic. Yes, topic. Inshallah. Probably will take a few weeks. Inshallah. I think so. <laughs> Thank you very much for your expert 